Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar, Wealth Care Update, Property Advice Series Part 1, Stepping On and Stepping Up Property Ladder. My name is Jan Gaskell. I'm Head of Personal Financial Planning Community here at ICAW, so I'm going to be facilitating today's webinar. But before I introduce our speakers for the day, I just really want to run through how today's session will work. Um, and as sure you know we are all working on a, a virtual basis today so we're delivering this from various sitting in our home offices in various parts of the country we've run a whole series of webinars since well we always do but even more since the the lockdown and these have all generally gone extremely well however there is of course inevitably the occasional tech glitch so if that happens you'll see that uh, you have a box where you can type in your problem and my colleague Kate Strawson will be on hand to deal with that. Now, the webinar is planned to last for one hour. Uh, we want to try and make the webinar interactive. So during the course of the webinar, do please type in your questions, which can then be submitted to our speakers. If you could please just indicate whether you want that to be answered by Kate Faulkner or by Jatin Patel, uh, and I'll introduce them more formally in a second. Uh, then please, if you can do that in the uh, question box, that would be very helpful. We'll try to pick up these questions at the end of the webinar, but both uh, Kate and Jatin have very kindly said that they'll be able to uh, pick, that up those late, pick up on those later. So hence, if you flag up who you want to ask that question, that obviously make that a lot easier. Now, as I said, um, I want to make this uh, interactive, but just to try and help our speakers to begin with, if you could please just kindly indicate in the little box in front of you whether you've webbed, uh, logged into the webinar specifically or particularly for personal interest, as a professional advisor or both, I'd be grateful. And then that will just help to set the scene a little. Um, it takes a few moments for those questions uh, to be factored into the system. So I just want to spend a little time introducing our speakers. As I say, we have Kate Faulkner, she's one of the UK's leading property experts. She runs a consumer site called Property Checklist and is also a member of a number of working uh, parties and groups around various stakeholders input into the whole property market in the UK. And then, again, I'd like to introduce our other speaker for today, which is uh, Jatin Patel from Kinnison's. Uh, Jatin's a chartered accountant and the former uh, founding partner in Kinnison's, who are independent property financial experts. And Kinnison's are also a content partner for our personal financial planning community and provide uh, an awful lot of good uh, help and support. So that's an interesting response. Uh, primarily, uh, we, well, rather, we've got a large number of people who've logged in for personal interest uh, and actually quite a significant number of people who've logged in for both. So that does help sort of set the scene a little. Just to, to drive that level of understanding a bit uh, farther forward, could you please just indicate uh, whether you're principally logging in as a first-time buyer, a second stepper, or set a step down a last time mover. Just whilst you're doing that, uh, please, please bear in mind that this webinar forms part of a series of wealth care webinars that we've been delivering over the course of the last couple of months. And we're going today to be focusing on first time buyers and second steppers. But we then have two further webinars, which will be looking at uh, second steppers and trading down and retirement mortgages in particular on June the 19th. And then on the 1st of July, we have a third webinar, which will be looking at uh, renters and landlords. So really, we're trying to provide input for, for just about everybody in there. So do please uh, just indicate on that slide there uh, why you're particularly coming in today. So, so we'll see how that's looking. Okay, All right, that's, that's interesting. It's breaking down reasonably equally but particularly uh, first-time buyers and second steppers. And as I say, we will be touching down on some points later on, on step down and last time movers. But again, that will be followed up by uh, another webinar subsequently. So uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to pass you uh, just to introduce our speakers. And I'm going to be sort of running this session really as a bit of a, a structured Q&A. So first of all, question for Kate, very much first-time buyers. Should I buy or should I wait, Kate? What are your views on that? <laughs> well, that's a million-dollar question. Um, so what 
uh, I'm going to do is walk you through a few slides. So bear with me while I just do this. There's an awful lot of um, rubbish that comes out about property prices um, in the media. And it's such a shame because actually we have amazing data now going back five years on um, the property market and we kind of don't get to use it. So um, to answer that question, it's really important that um, everybody I work with and it's great to be here to talk to you today to show you how to kind of interpret um, property price data for yourselves and for your clients, uh, which of course is important. So first thing I want to do is kind of bust some myths really. Um, this is the land registry data and this is the most accurate data historically. So it won't tell you what's happening today, but it'll tell you what's happening historically. And this data goes back about 20 uh, years, if not a little bit further. What you can see there is for those that remember the 90s is that prices were as flat as a pancake. We had a big rise between 2000 and 2005. We had the peak 2007, when we'll all remember uh, the credit crash. Prices fell um, and then they rose again. And really, just to summarize that, certainly, and this is for London, bear in mind, and I'll talk about other regions in a minute. Over time and to date, prices have always risen. So if you bought, bought some time ago, as long as you held on to a property, the rise in uh, prices. But the bit that will surprise you is that actually most people don't realize um, is that uh, affordability has actually improved. Do you know what everybody talks about? It says, oh, oh, it's terrible. It's really difficult to afford. There's kind of two parts to it. The one is deposit. That's definitely got harder. But as far as paying the mortgage concern, it's got a lot easier. And it might be a surprise to most people who are probably sitting there thinking, wow, I wish I'd bought a property for £78,000 in London uh, back in the 90s and held on to it. Well, you might not have felt like that at the time. This is a great little piece of data, very, very rarely used. And it's nationwide updated every quarter. What you can see there is that you might have been able to buy that property for £78,000 in London back in the 90s. But actually, it would have cost you 90% of your salary. That's nine zero um, uh, percent of your salary. And that's why, for those that remember, there were so many people handing back keys and the repossessions. So when people talk about affordability, certainly from paying the mortgage perspective, it's never been um, as high as that anywhere since uh, or any time since then. So the question is, as John right, said earlier, so should people buy an uncertainty? And the answer is, well, some people kind of have no choice. And the reason people worry is because, well, what would happen if prices crash? What ha and what they don't worry as much about, which is probably more likely, what happens if they get sick? What happens if they lose their job? Uh, and what happens if they split up? And certainly all four of those are quite possible um, in these difficult times that we have. And one of the things that I do say to people and go back to them is say, look, you know, when you buy a property, as long as you can hold it, and you're not forced to sell. And there's lots of ways of doing that. So just we will talk about sort of other things, but you can insure against um, getting sick and losing your job, for example. You could rent the property out if that was allowed and it was legal. Um, so you could, it's about helping people understand that it's okay to buy at any time. And it's more importantly that you buy personally when it suits them. And in London, for example, I uh, talked to a lot of first time buyers there. Even though people bought property there and prices crashed by about 20%, that property would be worth 60% more than they bought it for in 2007. So it's all about your ability. We should stop worrying about prices. It's more about your ability to hold on to that property um, and never be forced to sell. And if we can switch people's mindset to that, it actually takes a lot of stress out of the process, it gets people to make more sensible decisions. Um, but what you might be surprised at if you are a Londonite is that that picture is not um, the same right across the country. And certainly anybody in the Northeast will know that uh, there's some prices that are still 50, 50 that's 5% lower than they were 13 years ago. And particularly in Northern Ireland where prices had a real bubble that got burst. Um, and that, that we are seeing prices a lot lower. And by the way, bearing in mind your profession, that isn't taking into account um, inflation. So um, that's a real sort of stark warning um, as to how the real value of housing in some areas have fallen. And what I've done here is just put a little chart um, which shows you the annual average price increase back to about 20 years, back to 2005, back to the credit crunch, 2007, um, and then what they're doing year on year. And I 
pretty much ignore year on year prices and I definitely ignore month on month stuff. This is what's really interesting. If you take price back to 2000, pretty much everywhere, if you took a price today, took it back to 2000, every single year people would have seen five, six, seven percent, maybe a little bit more in London increase on that property price. You start taking it from 2005. Um, lots of reasons for that, which we'll probably discuss in the buy to let side. House prices have hardly driven, risen in most regions um, uh, in line with inflation, with um, the exceptions of the southeast and London doing a little bit better. And you start taking it back to 2007 prices, well, the northeast is still 10% lower. That's one zero, 10% lower than they were. And again, that's in nominal terms. So regionally, we have massive, massive price differences. And that's very rarely explained or understood by the media. And a lot of people say, well, should I buy now, Kate, or should I wait for prices to fall? And I just say, well, good luck with that. This is the land registry data, and it shows you that month on month, prices are going up and down all of the time. Um, and it's very difficult to try and understand when's the right time to go in. And bearing in mind there's such a lack of properties for at this moment in time, people are not moving for 15 to 20 years. If you don't buy your dream house now, um, and in six months' time, you lose the opportunity to do that, was it worth it considering you're looking to buy that for the next five, 10, 15 years? Because um, you might have to, you always have to put a roof over your head. So you've got the cost of renting or the cost of staying with parents for longer. So for me, it's not about using house prices as a time to gauge when you buy and sell it. It's about somebody's personal financial circumstances and if they find the right property for them, and then making sure they mitigate anything that would cause them to be forced to sell. And I'm very reliant on people like yourselves getting that message across to people because the stress it takes out of their move and their decision making is absolutely huge. Okay, thank you, Kate. And a lot of, well, insights, uh, myth busting, looking at things on a more granular basis to make any kind of sense out of this and sitting on your hands, if you like, isn't necessarily a good plan. However, that all sounds very good in theory, but Jatin, will I be able to find a mortgage in the current environment? Uh, good afternoon, John, and, and to all the delegates who have um, who've dialed in today. Um, yes, I mean, the finance industry has had an inter interesting time over the last few months, particularly since um, uh, the impact of the lockdown. So if we just have a look at how, firstly, governments and the regulators have reacted to COVID and um, the consequential lockdown. Firstly, we saw the unprecedented move by the Bank of England to reduce rates um, twice down to um, historic levels of 0.1%. And we also saw uh, the Chancellor, and the, uh, alongside with the regulator, announce uh, the concept of um, individuals who currently have a mortgage uh, and are impacted by COVID-19, whether uh, through their own work, uh, whether they're self-employed or they've been furloughed, to apply to their existing lenders for mortgage payment holidays. Now, um, similar to what um, Kate has been talking about, I too want to sort of bust a few myths around um, some of the um, press articles that went about um, in the uh, sort of early March when uh, banks were accused of um, stopping lending. Similar to all other businesses, banks were also faced with um, the lockdown from COVID-19. They were faced with having to make technology changes to allow more of their staff to work from home. Their own staff uh, were also impacted by having to isolate. And the other impact, obviously, was um, the stopping of physical property valuations taking place. So combination with all of that and uh, also having to deal with the IT changes uh, and the request for mortgage payment holidays, a number of lenders, whilst they, want, they still had the ability to lend and wanted to lend, were forced to um, curtail their pipeline, as it were, and withdraw a few products. And the products that particularly withdrew from the market were the, the higher loan-to-value products. And that was very much as an initial reaction, not uh, because they wanted to stop lending, but, all, uh, but more that they wanted to deal with the existing issues that they had around payment holidays and staff beginning to try and work from home and the IT changes that were required to deal with payment holidays. Um, what we initially saw as well with respect to the cut in Bank of England interest rates is uh, those interest rates were not immediately reflected uh, back in March, uh, April. 
uh, into mortgages. However, uh, those interest rates, uh, interest rate change was reflected where borrowers had variable rate mortgages. Now, since we moved through March and through to uh, uh, through April, uh, we as a business were able to continue helping clients uh, do refinances, so refinance their existing mortgage, and continue helping clients through um, purchases where they had already started that process and were quite a long way down that process before lockdown took place. So uh, one of the things that banks um, took on board and evolved was uh, the use of what we call um, automated valuation models, so AVMs. Um, so this became increasing use through sort of March, April time, where banks would use technology platforms and existing databases to be able to uh, carry out valuations remotely without requiring physical valuations. And these were particularly done where uh, loan to values were at the lower end. So um, not that sort of the 85, 90%, but um, at the lower end, and where the banks felt that they had good data uh, and were able to carry on and go ahead with the either refinance or the purchase. So banks continued to lend throughout that process, albeit uh, in smaller volumes, simply because um, they were dealing with their resource issues around staff working from home and also um, technology, technology upgrades. However, as we sort of came through April and into May, we started seeing some of the easing of uh, the lockdown measures. Uh, and um, in, a sort of, in a sort of back end of May, we also saw the, the government announce the opening, of the opening up of the property market, allowing estate agents to start uh, opening up. And also what was absolutely key was um, valuers to start going and inspect uh, properties and, and start to look at um, valuations as well. Um, and as soon as we started to see that, immediately we started to see lenders start react to that uh, by bringing uh, more and more products back into the marketplace, and particularly products at a higher loan to value uh, from that perspective. So going up from sort of 60% up to up to 75 and 80, 85%. And as we've seen uh, in sort of in the last few uh, days and, and weeks, uh, you know, we've started, we've started to see the emergence of more products at the 90% loan to value space as well. And as we started to see more and more lenders come back in and more products come back uh, onto the platform very quickly, that's also led to additional competition. Banks are still very keen to lend and they have a strong appetite to lend as liquidity is strong within these banks. Uh, and that has led to uh, additional competition across the lending market for uh, mortgages, which has then started to drive rates down. And over the last two or three weeks, we constantly see on a daily basis um, banks coming out with new products, uh, revising existing products, bringing down rates um, and um, in terms of interest rate costs, and also uh, increasing the loan to value. So over the last couple of weeks, we've seen more and more lenders come back into the sort of 90% loan to uh, LTV market space. And that's very encouraging from our perspective, as obviously um, deposits uh, are difficult to come by, especially sort of for the first time buyer market. Um, but what is key is the market is constantly evolving, particularly for individuals who are looking to borrow more than 75%. And on a daily basis, we see banks uh, constantly changing their platform as their own circumstances change, uh, and they have to sort of react to that uh, on a constant basis. Just moving on to sort of first-time buyers, um, there is still quite a lot of help for first-time buyers across three, three areas, really. Firstly, um, government initiatives. Um, there are a number of initiatives that the government have introduced over the last few years. Um, the first one being sort of a stamp duty relief. So uh, for a first time buyer, um, where they buy a property that's below um, 500,000, uh, there is no stamp duty on the first 300,000 pounds worth of uh, property. And then a rate of 5% uh, applies for property, the property between the value between 300 and 500. And that's a significant saving for a first time buyer uh, and significant help for uh, There's also um, help to buy mortgages uh, that the government introduced and lenders have on their platforms. They're shared ownership. Uh, and there's also um, uh, the help to buy ISA that the government introduced, albeit that that uh, is no longer available for anybody who's starting uh, to save or considering saving for a, um, a mortgage. 
Um, outside the government, uh, we see a lot of first-time buyers um, look for family support uh, when it comes to raising the deposit. So again, there we have either um, parents um, providing loans or gifts to, to families, um, to, to first-time buyers. Um, and also, we also have uh, parents potentially agreeing to be part of the mortgage application process where an individual may not meet, uh, meet the income requirements for a particular mortgage. So again, there's support that that first-time buyer market can get from families. And finally, banks. So they've also tried to do quite a significant amount to help the first-time buyers onto the stepladder. Um, and um, two main areas that they've really tried is sort of uh, introduce products, uh, so innovative products such as um, things like we see in the marketplace, uh, products like the family springboard mortgage, uh, family boost, lend a hand. Um, also, lenders are uh, allowing parents to be part of the mortgage application process to support and unpin uh, a first-time buyer's um, credit case and, and submission. In addition to that, um, we also see products out in the marketplace where um, there, there is a help for some of the costs associated uh, where a buyer buys a property. So costs around uh, legal costs, moving costs, uh, valuation fees. So quite a lot of um, issues uh, uh, and support around that uh, perspective. So in short, John, um, to answer your question, we, we uh, over the last few weeks, particularly when the market has opened up, um, the number of products on the platform has significantly increased. Lenders have increased their loan to values. Rates have come down in the last few weeks to very competitive rates uh, in, that in that mortgage space. And um, uh, we see a, positive, a very positive outlook and a positive approach by lenders um, to help clients uh, um, get the finance that they need uh, for their property. Thanks, Justin. And I think that's uh, it's actually fascinating, you know, in the sense that the mortgage market sounds really very healthy uh, and active, competitive, and hardly in a state of, of deep freeze. And as Kate was saying earlier on, uh, when she start to really get underneath the surface and, and look more granular at this and, and take a longer term or even a medium term perspective for that matter, uh, sitting on your hands clearly does not seem to be, or putting yourself in the deep freeze, uh, clearly doesn't seem a very sensible proposition. Um, so just to, to kind of bring that to, uh, to a conclusion before we move on to second steppers, um, question for Kate and for Jatin. Um, Maybe if you both could offer two top tips as, as takeaways on what to do next for our, our audience. Kate, over to you first. Sure. So the first thing is to just really understand um, your affordability as a first-time buyer. And it doesn't matter if you're buying in a year's time, 18 months' time, or hoping to buy this year. Do go and speak to a mortgage broker. I think as a first-time buyer, direct to lender is not the best way to go. Um, and you need the help. A broker can be a massive help if you get the right person from the start to make sure you do all the steps in the right order because mm. a lot of first-time buyers don't realize what they are. Um, so that would be my uh, first tip. And the second tip is totally ignore everything you told about affordability in the media. Um, once you know how much you afford, then you can start looking and start, start looking at not at what... Uh, the portals are saying, we're going to start looking at sold property price data, and I'm going to talk about that in a little minute. It is an absolute gold nugget of information. It gives you an idea of how what price properties are actually selling at, and that is way, way more important than any of the stuff about average house prices. They're almost possibly one of the most misleading statistics from a consumer perspective. Great for banks, great for governments, great for people like me, but for a consumer, it's all about your individual property price on a street versus your affordability. That's all you should be focused on. So never, ever think you can't afford to buy until you've had a proper look. Mm. Wise advice. Jatin. Um, just, yeah, just a couple of points to add to Kate. I think the first thing is, um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there's a number of sort of reliefs available to first-time buyers, number of um, schemes available to first-time buyers. What I would suggest to, uh, to, to a first-time buyer is to make sure that you understand uh, for all of these sort of reliefs and schemes the definition of a first-time buyer because they will all have a different definition. 
uh, whether it's for stamp duty relief or it's help to buy, uh, whatever that may be, uh, it will be different. And if you're buying um, with a partner um, or, uh, the, the, or, um, or, or, or a sibling, make sure that both qualify for first time buyer status and the relief. Because if you find that, if you find that you don't through the process, uh, it may be the case that you may have to pull out simply because um, your mats do not add up and you've been relying on um, relief, uh, which, which uh, are, are no longer available. Um, the other thing I would say is um, um, if you are getting help from your family, make sure that you sit down with them and understand the help that you get from them, whether it is a, by way of a loan from parents, a gift from parents, uh, whether it's from grandparents, a similar scenario, um, or whether it's, it's support um, by them underpinning the mortgage application and agreeing to be part of that application process. It's key that you understand that and the impact that's going to have in your ability um, to be able to afford a mortgage and apply for a mortgage. Um, and also because uh, that's the reason why that's key is that lenders um, do ask for that information to understand where the deposit's coming from uh, and how a individual is going to be able to afford uh, their mortgage. Uh, and one final point, and, and absolutely key, is, you know, it, it's, you know, this is a good time to sort out your finances, and particularly credit scores are, are key. Um, take a look at your credit score, maybe just not on one website, a couple of websites. And if you have anything that's out there, not just your score, but anything that's outstanding in terms of maybe a, a, a credit card bill or a, or a, a mobile phone bill, uh, it's key that you get that resolved and issue matter resolved um, quickly before you make the mortgage application process, as that does have an impact on your ability to um, to get that mortgage. Thanks, Jatin. Lots of really good nuggets in uh, in all of that from both Case and Jatin. So, devil's in the detail. Uh, do your homework, take professional advice, be aware of the hidden mines and use this as an opportunity to get your own personal finances or, if you like, getting your house in order uh, so that you are in a good position to make that uh, first step and that today doesn't seem such a bad time to start doing that to me. So let's think about second steppers now. So my question is, uh, to Kate again is we've heard about first-time buyers, but what about second steppers who may have a property to sell? Kate, what are your comments on that? Well, I, I don't think I ever thought I'd be I'd be send, doing a slide like this because normally it's about pricing and everything else. But um, the first thing to understand if you've got a property to sell and you're, and you're buying is the market is nothing like what it was before uh, COVID. And I'm not talking prices now. What I'm talking about is you have to, you can't just think I'm going to, oh, I'll see what my house is worth and I'll see what I can afford. Um, we're only the, mar the home moving market is only really at this stage interested in moving people that need to move. Um, and if you do need to move, you have got to do more preparation than you have ever done uh, before. You can't even pop into an agent, for example. You've got to make an appointment. Um, the agent should be um, uh, making a video of your property, for example, on their first visit because we're encouraging everyone, every buyer, to look at video viewings first to narrow down uh, the number of properties that they actually want to view. And all of this advice is all about the home moving market. We've all worked together right across the industry to try and keep everybody safe and make sure that moving home doesn't contribute in any way, shape or form or as much as we possibly can to uh, people catching uh, COVID. Um, the other thing is, I mean, you guys will be really good at this anyway, but um, it's certainly if you've got clients, it's all about the paperwork. So the IDs, contracts, other documents, the way we do all of that is changing. I'm sure it is for the same, you know how to do IDs and everything. Moving um, to either video uh, IDs or uh, to electronic methods. And the other thing you understand is that uh, if you've got an agent coming around or surveyor coming around, or you're going to buy a property or that you're visiting a property you'd like to buy, we're asking sellers to make sure that all the windows and doors uh, uh, and need to be open, obviously not the front door, but all the other ones. Um, and that ideally, I would want personally an agent to uh, be showing people around. And my job as a seller would be to stand outside, be in the car, 
down to wherever I might need to be. And again, this is about lessening the number of people um, that are actually in the in the property. So we've suggested a limit of two people viewing. And please, 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 if you leave the kids at home, um, it's going to be far less stressful for everybody. Um, and the other, just the little thing is that if you've got two people from different households, so certainly if you're two first-time buyers buying, but you're currently in different households, you will need to view it at times. So obviously you can do one after the other. Um, and you can all meet up in the kind of uh, in the outside space afterwards. But please make sure that yourselves and your clients understand the new rules um, to make sure that we keep everybody safe. That is our concern at this moment in time. And it's no joke putting your property on the market at the moment because we are asking you to clean everything before and after. It's not complicated. It's all the touch points that you'd expect. Um, and uh, we're also agents. Anybody coming into your property should be using hand sanitizers before and after. And that way we can kind of do this stuff um, uh, pretty easily. So um, section, and I've given you some uh, information, further information there. So I said earlier, um, ignore what you hear in the newspapers and the media with regards to property prices because it's, and, and really the indices. So how on earth do you, as a buyer and seller, understand what's happening in your market? Um, and the reason you can do that is certainly from buying and selling perspective. We've got data going back by 25 years of what properties are what probable, and of course, you know um, on the market for at the moment because you go and have a look at the portals. And it's whether you're doing this as a professional. So if anybody comes to me, first thing I ask them to do for, before I give advice is give me their address. And then I check what, what they bought that property for. Because my advice to them, if they've got no equity in the property, would be very different um, to if they've got lots of equity in that property. And you can find that out as a professional or indeed if you're doing this personally. And you can see on the examples here, this idea that prices double every 10 years um, or they're always going up, it's a complete myth. So yes, in the London and the South East, you still see some growth, probably areas around East Anglia. Certainly the rest of the country hasn't seen anything like the growth that we've seen before. So the way you basically price a property, um, but ideally before you get an agent round, is you go and find out what previous properties have sold for and then what they're currently on the market for, particularly if, they've, if they're on the market, but they've got a sold subject to contract. That rather suggests you've got a good agent and it rather suggests they perhaps put that at the right price. So that's how you should worry about house prices and ignore what's going on. You might even we see such individual um, markets. So I've got a kind of four bed detached farmhouse and I might want to retire down to a, a two flat. Well, my farmhouse might be going down in value and my two bed flat might be going up in value. So I might need to sell my property before I then go and buy another one. So it's really, really important to understand your own market before you kind of go into it. Not talking to talking to agents is um, the other way of doing that. Um, and people shouldn't necessarily worry about house prices falling. Um, potentially, if you can buy, you're not forced to sell, then you can get a good deal. And buying and selling prices are less relevant because if you sell an existing property, your own property for 10% less, you can save money um, on the set, more money on the second property. Um, obviously, some equity things in there. But in the last recession, people were like jumping several um, uh, rungs up the ladder and really getting onto properties that they never thought they would be able to um, able to achieve. So um, very much less uh, less of a thing to kind of worry about from their perspective. Thanks, Kate. Lots of, again, really insightful stuff in there. Perhaps one of the the good things that will come out, um, I can use the word good, which is questionable, out of COVID is it's going to be a, a catalyst to, to better more modern and professional uh, practices actually in the property market. I wonder whether that will actually happen or not. So, we hope so. chat in, Chris. We hope so. Indeed we do. Um, and I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, but uh, I suspect that we, we might end up with some improvements in that respect. But perhaps I'm just naive rather than optimistic. Um, so question for, to Jatin. Uh, what's the mortgage market like in this sector of the market? We've heard about first time buyers where things look pretty good, to be honest. Um, but what about uh, second steppers? Sure, John, and and obviously for second steppers, it's 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 a it's a very different, um, slightly different playing field in the sense that they don't have some of the incentive schemes that I spoke about earlier. 
Um, the first thing to think about for a second stepper is very much whether you have, you know, what is your current circumstances? Have you taken a mortgage payment holiday? Have you been furloughed? Um, if you're self-employed, uh, what kind of uh, situation are you in? Um, have you had to stop working because of the lockdown rules? Um, and it's very key, key, it's absolutely key that you assess what your current position is and understand that. Secondly, um, going forward, it's important to understand how you're going to look going forward in terms of um, returning to employment, coming out of furlough. Um, also, in terms of if you're self-employed um, or, or a partner in the business, um, how is that business going to look post, um, post lock, lockdown? And how long will it take you to start to get back to the earning capabilities that you were earning prior to, um, to lockdown? Um, so that, that's key, and it's important to understand your financial position and do, the, do, do that maths um, straight away um, as soon as possible. The next thing, is, as Kate has mentioned, is, is really uh, understand, you know, how much equity are you going to have in your current property uh, and make the decision very early on as to whether you're going to sell that property to, to move up or retain it um, uh, with respect to, uh, with a view to let, letting that out because that will have an impact on the level of equity that you have, uh, which will have an immediate impact on the, the amount of deposit um, that you're going to place for your future purchase and um, eventually the sort of loan to value that you're going to get uh, with respect to a mortgage to help you assess uh, the property bracket price that you can start to look at. Um, and, and also assess what well, other help you may be able to get. Um, clearly, um, help from family and friends um, is, 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 is available to, to anyone, not just first-time buyers. The other thing to be keep uh, clear of in, in, when you're doing your maths is what your stamp duty liability is going to be, because assuming that you're going to be stepping up, um, you're going to be buying a property which is uh, of a higher value than your current property, um, so your stamp duty li liability will be significant. And it's also important to understand um, how the chain is going to work and whether you're going to be able to sell your existing property either at the same time as buying your new one or before. And the reason for that is, um, as a lot of um, delegates will know, we have an uh, additional stamp duty surcharge that applies uh, where someone own, uh, buys a second home. Albeit you're able to get a refund of that at a later stage, it is important to understand that from a cash flow perspective, you need to pay that liability um, before reclaiming it at a later stage. In terms of the impact of COVID and, and whether you've taken a mortgage payment holiday, um, the government and the regulator did announce that um, this, uh, uh, where an individual applies for a mortgage payment holiday because they've been impacted by COVID, uh, that that should not affect their credit score. And that certainly is the case. However, what we do expect lenders to do is, is ask um, through, through the mortgage application process ask borrowers whether they have actually taken a holiday or not. And they may or may not take that into consideration when deciding the level to, to lend to you or whether to lend to you at all. So it is important that you understand your current position and also understand the position you're going to be in going forward um, as well and, and have the necessary documentation. So, for example, if you've been furloughed and are going to go back into employment, do you have documentary evidence from your existing employer that they will employ you back uh, 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 at, at, the, at the salary that you were on previously? Uh, in terms of um, self-employed, um, most lenders, if not all lenders, will treat the self uh, will treat uh, self-employed on a manual case by case basis. So all applications by self-employed individuals uh, will be reviewed uh, on a case by case basis. And a lot more information is going to be required to support your mortgage application pro uh, process, particularly with respect to your business. Uh, and that includes not just historic accounts, um, but they also want uh, a forecast of how your business is going to come out through COVID, what the finances are going to look like through that, through that period, what industry sector you, you work in. I mean, one of the things that COVID has clearly shown is that um, you know, during lockdown, certain industry sectors are far more impacted than, than others, uh, and lenders have taken that on board and will take that into consideration when considering mortgage applications. And uh, what is the likelihood of your ability uh, in, in your business to return to what would be what we're all referring to as the new normal 
post-COVID and how quickly will that be? Um, so all of that will, uh, will need to be submitted. It will need to be explained uh, in your mortgage application process. Uh, all of that's required in order to be successful uh, when applying for a mortgage. And in terms of um, actual the, the, the mortgage market itself, as I spoke about earlier, um, it is extremely buoyant. Uh, lenders are keen to lend. However, we have to understand that, obviously, from their perspective, uh, they want to be uh, sensible uh, and they want to be doing what they call lending to people who can afford the mortgage that they've applied for. Um, so we expect them to do the due diligence uh, that they're asking for. I think it's important that uh, we, we put that together and uh, make, the, make the case uh, as solid as possible for um, someone to be able to take that next step up the ladder. Hey, thanks, Chatin. Again, full of insightful, rich material. I think the message that clearly comes out of that to me is, is take professional advice and get your, your affairs in good order and thoroughly thought through before you go and even approach a mortgage lender. Um, so just to wrap that particular chapter up, uh, same sort of thing, really. A couple of top tips from Kate and then a couple of top tips from Chatin. Kate. Yeah, so the first tip is really understand the market for your own property. Is it hot or cold? Um, and are you going to have to price really keenly um, to make sure that you get um, offers coming in and, and viewings uh, of, the, of the ones that will be available? Um, and I think the other side of it is really is not worrying so much about um, what's happening in the market because say you'll be selling your property and buying another one and the next one you're buying is probably going to be your dream home and that's going to be a 20 year one and there's one thing i can guarantee during that period of time is the property price uh the property that you buy will go up down and stay the same in price during that period of time so again brokers are actually key in this because you are worried about price falls when you're buying for 15 to 20 years you just don't want to be forced to sell exactly the same as first time buyers and Brokers can help you mitigate um, uh, the issues that arise from that. So it is really key to make sure that uh, you can buy and you can buy safely. And at the end of the day, having been locked down for the last two months, if you haven't been happy in your home, don't worry so much about prices. Worry more about putting a really nice roof over yours and your family's heads. That's way more important than anything else. Justin. And um, John, just a couple of things from my perspective, and it's something that Kate mentioned earlier, documentation is absolutely key. Um, creating a, and developing and putting together as much evidence as you possibly can about your ability to afford the mortgage that you're looking to apply for to allow you to buy the house that you want and the home that you want will be absolutely key uh, and will help um, any, any credit case and any mortgage application process. Um, and it's making sure, the other point to make sure is that documentation that you put together is consistent uh, and tells a consistent story for you um, and doesn't tell a story that's uh, mixed and confusing. The other thing is, um, one of the things that we've noticed in some of the mortgage applications being made uh, over the last few uh, few weeks is, um, uh, is, is really how little or how much people have reduced their expenditure. So one of the things that uh, is required for documentation purposes for a mortgage application is um, copies of bank statements whether that's three or six months. And one of the things that we've, we've seen and noticed when we've applied for our clients for mortgages um, is how, um, how bank statements and the entries have changed um, sort of from uh, sort of May and June uh, compared to what they look like January and February and how little is being spent on. And this is a very good time for you to review your finances, review what your, non, your essential expenditure and non-essential expenditure is. Um, and really understand um, uh, where your money is going um, so that uh, we can, again, uh, make your case for affordability uh, on what, we, what is truly essential expenditure as opposed to what we would call discretionary expenditure. Mm, thanks, Justin. Again, get, get your application right and sorted and go to people like Justin, really, to find out where the devil in the detail is and the, the, the hidden minds, as I like to call them. Now, um, we're going to be spending about uh, five minutes, really, on this next section. As I said, we've got a webinar on the 19th of June this month where we're going to be going into more detail, for example, around retirement mortgages and trading down, some of the other points we picked up excuse me, picked up on. But just to begin with, um, Kate, any sort of general 
reflective thoughts and is now the time to think about trading down. Kate? Yes, it's probably, I have to say, I've worked in uh, this market because I used to do part exchange for retirement builders um, and it's one of my favourite ones because uh, you've gone through all the stresses and strains now. You've probably owned your property since 2000, if not before. So you're sitting on a bucket load of equity. Um, it's not the case for everybody I know, um, but you've kind of had all those trials and tribulations and now it's about um, understanding and, and about moving to somewhere that, it, I, I hate to say final place, but I have done it with some people and that, let's be realistic, that's probably what it's, what it's going to be. So from a client perspective, please, please, the first thing you've got to do is explain to them what's changed because they are often terrified, absolutely terrified of agents, terrified of putting their house on the market, terrified of people coming to view places. Um, and I would in this case uh, very much recommend that that uh, everybody, if you're trading down, you instruct a legal company from day one of marketing. We are actually going to be running something over the summer that everybody should be doing this be during COVID. Um, the other thing is, um, I think people, I don't know if you've ever watched Escape to the Country. <laughs> it is one of my favorite programs. Um, but uh, people have a very idealistic, I'm going to move and we're going to buy all of these acres and we're going to have all of these um, uh, uh, animals, etc. So uh, my dad had a fantastic life at the age of 58. Um, he got Parkinson's shortly uh, followed by dementia. Um, and that would have just been a disastrous move. Um, and unfortunately, we have to appreciate that at that stage, unless you're very lucky, some sort of illness is going to occur. So actually advising being near to good hospitals, doctors, family is not a bad thing. Um, and the other thing is, is they often are moving and this is really Jitan's territory um, because of family and friends. And the worst thing is, is they never, ever take advice about how to pass that money on. And that's crucial. People really caught up in that. But I won't say that much more. But it is, it is my biggest fear that people trade down and just hand over the money without proper advice. Um, so for me, it's all about being as practical as possible while achieving your kind of dreams time when you're going to retire you have more time on your hands etc um and it's really really important to make sure this is about you you're not trading down so kids can add all of those kind of things and understanding from start is this your last move or are you planning another one after that and making sure that you have the enough money each time to do it because it isn't uh, the cheapest of things so um i think really for me those are kind of the the most important uh, things to think about um that it's very much all about you it's not about everybody else um and these are just sort of restressed these are all the reasons so pension investment by to let is another one i get very regularly buy a holiday home that's all lovely but please 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 don't do any of these things without some financial advice, because you might not necessarily, with something like equity release, need to move at all. Um, and I hopefully that very quickly and neatly um, passes over. <laughs> Thanks. So think before you leap. Jatin, stays of play in yeah, this uh, finance in this market? Uh, yes, John. Um, very quickly, um, the, the state of play in this in this area is has improved significantly. I would say over the last five to ten years, and the reason for that is uh, lenders and banks have recognised that we have an ever increasing ageing population. Um, more and more borrowers are working um, longer uh, and um, beyond re beyond retirement age. Uh, and also, there's a growing need for cash flow, whether it's to help children, grandchildren onto the property ladder, it's whether to pay for medical expenses, um, whatever that may be, uh, there has been a growing need uh, for um, for cash flow during the later later life. Um, and very much so, the um, options that um, individuals have has grown with that, uh, with the market. So um, some lenders, um, are, with some lenders, you're able to apply for a normal mortgage. Um, and again, like I said, lenders are willing to um, lend into uh, a, a lot longer. Um, clients also have the ability to apply for something called a retirement interest only mortgage, which we acronym as a RIO. Um, and as Kate has mentioned, there's, there's sort of lifetime and equity release mortgages. And one thing I would say that in this space over the last five, year, five years or so, um, lenders have really started to incre increase the level of flexibility within these products. Uh, and we're seeing more and more lenders come into this space with more and more flexibility. Uh, so it is key, as Kate mentioned, that um, you understand your position, you, t you take advice, 
um, and you consider all the options available to you, as there are a number of them available to you, uh, with uh, lenders again out there uh, who are keen to lend in this space. Uh, and the other reason why we've seen an increase in uh, interest in this area is obviously historic, um, with historic uh, interest rates being so low, uh, that the cost of finance in, that, in this space has also come down as well. Uh, I'm just conscious of, of time, John, so I'll, I'll stop there. And as you said, we, we do talk about this in more detail uh, in, in the webinar that uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to look at next week. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Indeed, we've got a lot of questions coming in around this area and all the other areas for that matter. So, uh, as I say, both, both Justin and Kate will be uh, able and willing to pick up on the questions afterwards. At the end of the session, there'll be a survey and an opt-in option in there so that will help the uh, the whole course of things so obviously do do opt in to help the dialogue but a few questions just that we can deal with uh, first one uh, there's been a couple around this actually um, so I'll, I'll put this one to Kate first help to buy good or bad idea um, I like help to buy been a lot of um, criticism of it but certainly at the moment without 95% mortgages being that prevalent um, it's actually quite a good scheme because you can still buy a property with a five um, uh, deposit. Um, new builds are so much better than they were. There's still some of the boxes around, but um, lots of good developers. Most important thing is before you look at any new build, go and check out their Builders Federation five-star rating and certainly go for the five-star guys first. Um, and if you haven't got any of those in the area, four-star. But just be aware that some of them don't have the best of reputations um, uh, and uh, some of them have an excellent reputation. But no, I like help to buy. I think it's a potentially a good, a good option for someone. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I just um, I I'd always get a survey. You know, if you buy a new property, get a proper snagging survey. Um, not necessarily going to be right, the, dream, yeah. the dream that you were hoping yeah, for. Great um, yeah, and make, so, make sure there are Royal Institute Chartered Surveyor doing it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Jatin, post-COVID-19, bit of a crystal ball one here, but certainly coming in, will London be a less attractive option in terms of residential <laughs> property purchase? Hmm. <laughs> well, this is an interesting one. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, I mean, um, with lockdown and, and um, you know, a lot of people being um, stuck in their city centre flats uh, with very little green area, um, we may well see um, people start thinking about moving further out. I think what's going to be a particularly key point on this one is um, the reaction of employers with respect to working from home and remote working. Um, and certainly, obviously, from, from the perspective of, of sort of living in central London and living near your workplace to reduce your commute time, um, if you're still having to go into work on a regular basis, then um, staying in central London may be the case. However... Um, if your employer post-COVID goes into a more flexible working environment where you are allowed to work more from home um, and you're not required to live uh, close to your work, then certainly we do see uh, people um, starting to think about moving further out um, and, um, and then uh, commuting becomes less of an issue. Yeah, I think that's, that's going to be an interesting dynamic, isn't it, that, that plays out going forward with the whole issue of... Uh, spent working patterns changing and as you say the need to go into an off, uh, your office as it were five days a week uh, perhaps becomes a, a very yeah. dated concept but who knows we'll see um right yeah. quite a lot of questions coming in around stamp duty um some of the more detailed <laughs> others uh but i think one that is coming in a lot and this is a crystal ball but i'd be interested just to quickly hear your uh, reflections on this on Changes in stamp duty. What do you think the, on the Richter scale of probabilities that one's likely to be? Firstly, Kate, and then quickly over to Jatin. Um, so, something like uh, most people don't actually pay stamp duty. This is a real London South East issue. Um, so, uh, whether um, the government will do anything about it, the industry is definitely calling for it. Um, my view is is that we should perhaps just make people aware of how little, how few buyers and sellers pay pay stamp duty. And my view is is do you know what guys, you've got to pay tax somewhere. So the other opportunity is is you pay tax uh, based on the sales price rather than the price you buy. 
um, and uh, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. So, uh, sorry, my Dalmatian just um, decided he wants to come and say hello. Um, so, um, it, for me, I don't think there'll be any changes. I don't think we need any changes. Um, and uh, 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 But I know everybody wants that. I'm probably a bit of a lone soul, but you've got to pay tax somewhere, guys. Jacqueline, just your, your concluding thoughts. Um... I think from my perspective, um, on the whole, I generally agree with uh, Kate's comments. Uh, the one area where uh, I may think um, may provide an incentive is, is for those individuals who are looking to step down um, and, and potentially provide them with uh, an incentive to do that with respect to stamp duty relief. It may be the case that a lot of individuals who are living in properties um, too big for themselves and uh, uh, and they could sort of move down and allow that home to, you know, a family to move into that home. Um, the stamp duty may be a deterrent. Um, and if we can get rid of that deterrent, then it may help them make that decision to move down uh, and, uh, and let a family move into that, uh, into that house and home. Thanks, Justin. Um, just correcting my own uh, typographical area, error of earlier on, which basically means I couldn't read my own handwriting. Of course, the next webinar is on the 17th of June, not the 19th of June. <laughs> so apologies for that. Now, um, unfortunately, we're not going to really be able to deal with, uh, with any more questions um, other than just in one minute, Jatin, um, Implications of people who use the option of payment uh, holidays for mortgages. Are there some, some issues in there, do you think, that perhaps might not be quite so apparent? Just in, in 60 seconds. What, what I would say is if you're thinking about taking a payment holiday, um, then uh, review your finances. Make sure that it, it, that is the right option for you. Um, and discuss that with your bank because it may be not be the case that you have to take a complete holiday, uh, that you could just uh, reduce your payments. And the other thing to remember is that um, this is not a forgiveness of the amount that you owe. You will still owe that amount um, and, um, and you will still have to pay that back in the future. Uh, Two-edged sword, I think, perhaps. Yeah, might be, yeah, yes. might be the, uh, my take on that one. Uh, so to be treated with caution, but it's there, which is which is great, of course. So uh, just to wind the session up, uh, massively informative. I learned a huge amount from this. So uh, uh, an enormous thank you to uh, Kate and Jatin. As you can see, the contact details are there in front of you. Uh, they'll be picking up questions for you afterwards. If you're not a member of the ICAW personal financial planning community already, then do please join. It's very easy to do so. It's not going to, you're not going to be charged for that. It's also open to other professionals other than chartered accountants who've got a, an interest in the whole PFP area. There's the link in front of you. Keep you updated on uh, stuff coming forwards and also a copy of these presentations will be put on that site as a matter of course in due course. Um, so as you can see in front of you, these are the dates, the correct dates uh, for the subsequent sessions that we're going to be uh, launching. We'll be covering a lot of rich material in there in a sort of similar fashion to the one of today. So I hope you have found this helpful and useful, which I'm sure you have. And as I say, do please complete the survey at the end and you'll be able to view the webinar on the PFP site uh, later on when that's posted there. And again, thanks to Kate Strawson for having made all this uh, possible and dealing with some of those uh, tech problems that came in during the course of the session. So, Kate, thank you. Jatin, thank you. And look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us.